Hey guys, I'm here with chapter 10 of Alan Strange and there's only two more after this. So there's only 12 chapters in the book. So this is the last chapter you'll hear being read from me. All right, it is Saturday, 11.08 p.m. at the Delport Historical Museum. Shaw waited until the local police officer wandered into one of the exhibit rooms, then slipped through the front glass doors with a disguised shake of his a disgusted shake of his head. Berg's entry into the building had obviously alerted the police. However, the cop's cautious but unhurried movements indicated that he had not actually seen the inept UFO investigator yet. If necessary, he would make sure the cop didn't interfere with Berg's search for the alien transmitter. Shaw studied the layout of the lobby and eased back into the darkness by an alcove housing a display of American Pioneer household items. The shadows provided the perfect camouflage for a man dressed entirely in black, and he had deliberately positioned himself close to the front doors. The building had other doors, a delivery door in back and two emergency exits. Shaw had blocked them. When Berg found and secured the alien transmitter, he would have to leave the museum through the front door. Neither Berg nor the sinister signaling device would escape the ARC agent's grasp. Saturday, 11.14 p.m. Robbie and Josh huddled in the narrow, dark space between the family of caveman display and the hunter display. Aunt Alan quickly ducked back when Jersey entered through a door at the opposite end of the room. I'm going to try and grab his backpack, Alan whispered. It's too dangerous, Robbie hissed. Not as dangerous as being overrun by alien robots intent on total destruction, Josh said. There's no choice, Robbie. We must get the Aruby signaling crystal. Alan removed his makeshift tracking device from his wrist and gave it to Josh. I'll have to run and hide after I secure the bag. This will lead you to the crystal and me. If you've got the crystal, Robbie said, it'll lead Phil Berg right to you too. That's a chance we have to take, Alan said. Besides, once we deactivate the crystal, there won't be a signal for Mr. Berg to track. If we can turn it off, Josh slumped against the back wall. Resolved, Alan crouched by the front of the displays, prepared to pounce when Jersey walked by. He had the advantage of surprise. However, just as he was about to leap out, Phil Berg walked in through the door beside the Hunter display case. Berg paused in the glow of the security light just beyond the alcove. Alan kept perfectly still, moving only his eyes to watch both men. Jersey spotted Berg and ducked behind a central display of primitive tools, bones, and artifacts. Berg suddenly looked up from his scanner, then flattened himself against the caveman family display case. Alan blinked, then realized Berg didn't want to be seen by Officer Mason, who had just entered through the far door. The police officer paused to shine his flashlight around the room. Alan tensed as Phil Berg moved along the front of the family display and ducked into the next alcove. Now he understood the human saying, three's a crowd. There were too many people in the exhibit room to snatch the bag from the thief without being detected. However, a modified plan occurred to him as he crept backward to join Robbie and Josh. What are you going to do? Robbie asked, her voice quivering slightly. A diversion is definitely required. Alan gripped Robbie's shoulder and stood up. I have an idea. Transforming his hand into Xelon light, Alan unlocked the access door on the side of the caveman hunter display and stepped inside. Then he opened a second access door on the opposite wall. Hoping the dim light in the display case would disguise the glow generated by the energy transfer, he placed his hands on two of the primitive fur-clad figures. Oh boy, Josh said softly. This should make for some interesting research for my report. Infused with Alan's Zelon life force, the two cavemen blinked, then grunted. One sniffed, then snorted, apparently finding Alan's scent unpleasant. Quickly losing interest in Alan, both animated cavemen stuck their heads out the second access door. Alan hesitated as he placed his hands on the remaining two figures. He could easily animate two beings without suffering any ill effects. Animating four would seriously deplete his energies. 
However, the more chaos he could create in the museum to confuse the thief, the better. And the policeman and Philberg, the better their chances of recovering the diamond. Alan closed his eyes and let his life force flow. Josh tensed as Caveman 1 and 2 jumped out of the display, startled by the glowing blue light emanating from Alan. 3 and 4 came alive with surprised grunts. Alan collapsed, drained by the energy transfer. Fearing for safety, Josh crept closer to the access door. Ignoring the unconscious boy, the two cavemen inside the case poked at the fake rocks and plants with a club and a spear. Josh held his breath. The sedate atmosphere and the, that had permeated the museum was shattered. Peeking over the edge of the center display case, Jersey start, stared in wide-eyed fright as Caveman 1 and 2 padded past him on the far side. Caveman 1 shrieked and covered his eyes when the beam of Officer Mason's flashlight bathed him in light. The policeman and 1 both froze. 2 paused to sniff, then turned around the alcove where Phil Berg was hiding between displays. Clutching the backpack with the Aruby crystal, Jersey bolted for the door by the hunter display. Caveman 3 saw him run by and into the lobby. Raising his club, 3 roared and jumped out of the display to chase the thief. Alerted by three, four crouched into a defensive posture and noticed Alan lying on the floor. He started to pro prod Alan's still form with his spear. Josh reacted instantly and threw the wrist tracking device at the caveman. While four cautiously poked the device with his spear, Josh and Robbie dragged Alan into the alcove, slamming the display case door behind them. Startled, Four raised his spear and jammed the blunt end into Alan's tracking device, smashing it. Great, Josh muttered. Now how are we going to figure out where Jersey is with the diamond? At least you got Alan out of there, Robbie said. Yeah, but if we can't find the diamond, we'll all be a ruby robot fo food by the morning. Hearing footsteps, Josh helped Robbie pull Alan into the darker shadows by the back wall. A moment later, Phil Berg slowly backed past their hiding, hiding place, holding out his tracking device. Caveman 2 appeared as he advanced on Berg. He paused to screech and shake his stone, at, stone Age axe. Berg threw his tracking device at the caveman, who caught it, sniffed it, then dropped it as he pounced toward the terrified alien hunter. Berg turned and ran. Josh scrambled forward to retrieve the device, then froze as Caveman 4 leaped in front of the alcove. Don't move, Josh, Robbie hissed. I'm too scared to move. 4 wrinkled his blunt nose and snorted as he leaned closer to glare at Josh. Josh's stomach tightened as he stared into primitive eyes that narrowed with menace. 4 was short, but he was also muscular, agile, and quick and he smelled like moldy fur and pungent sweat. Josh thought he was going to pass out from the stench until the caveman snarled and shook his spear. Josh glanced back as Alan woke up and shook his head. Having regained his strength, Alan stumbled forward with his hand extended as the caveman lunged. Josh scooted backward as Alan released a light trail. A light trail. The energy stream sent the stunned cavemen flying backward into the side of the center display case. Scurrying forward again on all fours, Josh grabbed the tracking device Berg had dropped. Across the room, Officer Mason was engaged in a bizarre confrontation with Caveman 1. Standing behind a low display case by the far wall, the policeman cautiously moved toward one end. Standing in front of the case, one moved along with him. When Officer Mason stopped and shook his flash flashlight to scare off the primitive man, one paused and shook his club at Officer Mason. Get lost, Mason shouted in frustration. Arg! the one loud loudly grunted back. Is that tracking unit working? Alan asked. Robbie crept up on Josh's other side, dragging her backpack and his duffel bag. Huh? Oh! Josh looked at the circular screen. The green digital arrow was pointing at him, but indicating that the diamond was somewhere in the building directly behind him. Yeah, and the crystal's still broadcasting. How much time is left, Robbie? Robbie checked her watch. Sixteen minutes. We'd better hurry, Alan said. 
As they started to crawl out of the alcove, Four stumbled to his feet. Everyone tensed when he glanced in their direction, then exhaled with relief as he quickly lumbered toward the far entrance, dragging his spear behind him. I guess one Zelon zap was enough, Josh grinned. Too bad one Zelon zap isn't enough to deactivate in a ruby transmitter. Handing Josh's duffel bag to Alan, Robbie waved Josh to move out with the tracking device. Officer Mason's attention was firmly focused on Caveman One, who was banging his club on the floor. Dragging the heavy duffel bag as he crawled behind Josh and Robbie, Alan wondered what they had brought to use as possible turnoff keys. He also wondered if they knew that what the chances of finding exactly the right sonic frequency were astronomically slim. They probably do, Alan thought. Of the many things he had learned about humans during his stay on Earth, one of the most intriguing was that humans never gave up, not even in the face of impossible odds. And right now, the odds were impossibly stacked against them. You'll have to listen to the last two chapters to see if they get it. See you later, guys.